All right, everyone, um, thank you for joining us. Uh, this is the second webinar that we're putting together this year in this program of uh, bringing some of these uh, matters that affect our industry and our profession and gathering people that we recognize as thought leaders and authorities that can share their actual real life experience and, and views. And today uh, we have a great panel and I'm very, very thrilled about the subject that we're gonna be talking about. And we were just chatting about the idea that uh, Santa Monica today represents uh, probably one example of what the housing element or the, uh, the, the need of housing development can do to cities in general. And of course, uh, when you start reading about this matter for us who are, um, practicing business in the uh, industry, reading that there will be development, feels like Santa is coming to town, and that's where the title came from. But today, and we were just talking about this uh, before, the conversation may get a lot more intricate and we may discover and unleash a lot of implications behind this push that sometimes feels like you're trying to uh, cover a lot of territory with a very small um, blanket. And there's something about that that we may be talking about today, which means when we're trying to fix a problem here, are we really not creating even a bigger problem uh, on another angle? So with that say, said, I will introduce uh, these three gentlemen that have agreed to join us today, and we are very uh, thankful for that. Adrian, uh, he's, I, I would I would rather, guys, if you don't mind, allow yourselves to, um, you know, kind of like talk a little bit about yourself and that sure. would be a little better. <laughs> hey, everybody. Adrian Berger, Cypress Equity Investments. I'm the Managing Director of Acquisitions for the company. We're a national institutional multifamily developer and operator. I'm based here in Los Angeles. Uh, in Los Angeles, we've built about uh, 2,500 units since 2010. And we currently have a pipeline of another 2,500 units. Most of those are in Santa Monica. We've been very active the last three years in buying land in Santa Monica. Um, so that's uh, that's what we do. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian. Okay. Yeah. Hi, I'm Jerry Newman. I'm the uh, head of real estate for California for DLA Piper, a large international law firm, probably like, I think we're the number three uh, largest law firm in the world today. I run the uh, real estate practice for California, but most uh, of my time is spent running the land use and administrative law practice where I entitle large, uh, small to large scale projects. Currently we're working on probably six studios, uh, about eight logistic facilities and in the housing realm, we're doing everything from uh, large single family home developments, either for single family uh, rentals uh, or large multifamily complexes. Probably in the pipeline that we're working on right now is about uh, uh, four or 5,000 units. And we work regionally throughout uh, Southern California and throughout California, uh, focused in this region. Pretty much every city. Sorry. Right on. Thank you, Thanks, Jerry. Jerry. Hi, I'm Brian Perkins. I'm with Callison RTKL Architects. Um, we're probably going to end up being with a, a new merger, one of the top five largest architecture firms in the world. Uh, we do work in Santa Monica, all of LA, and actually all over the world. Um, some of our projects uh, range upwards of 2,000 units, and some of our projects are down around 70 units. So uh, we have done work in Santa Monica before, and actually I'm a architect that lives and works now in Santa Monica because we're all remote. So um, definitely seeing the changes that are happening and excited about what's going on in Santa Monica and looking forward to potentially having some new projects locally um, as opposed to flying to Hong Kong and China and Jakarta all the time. So looking forward to this. That's uh, good for a change. All right, thank you, Brian. Um, I wanted to add that the fact that you live in Santa Monica was uh, an important factor in, in having you as part of this conversation. Yeah, uh, I, I feel like I can speak from a local resident's point of view as well as an uh, excited architect wanting to make change. <laughs> At the same time, no change in my backyard. So it's always I, uh, Yeah, I guess it's gonna be like the little kind of like duo of the uh, good and the bad. Uh, yeah, the together. people yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. All right. All right, guys. And uh, so thank you again for uh, joining us. Um, I do have a, a series of questions that I wanted to post and I wanted to hear thoughts. Uh, we were, of course, discussing that this um, housing element is not exclusive to Santa Monica, but we will be somehow starting with Santa Monica as a um, like um, a framework or a, a reference. And my first question, and I was just sharing this thought, like if I had to be the guy, the guy making the last decision on where to push this forward, I have a hard time thinking, is this going to be positive or not? Will this be positive from every perspective or is this going to be positive for you know, a smaller part of society, because we're not just talking about professional services here, we're talking about people and the community and a lifestyle that may be impacted by this in so many levels. So if I were to ask a very open and undefined question, uh, like, will this be positive? What would be your first reaction to it? I mean, as, as, the, as a developer, I, I think it's very positive um, and as a human, I think it's very positive because I think that Santa Monica, I mean, LA in general, but Santa Monica specifically has a, a chronic undersupply of housing. Um, as a city, it has grown over the last many decades, uh, becoming the tech sort of hub of West LA. And with that has come a lot of office workers, a lot of high paying jobs, but a lot more people who are interested in living in Santa Monica. And the stock of new housing supply is very, very limited. And I don't know exactly the numbers of houses that were uh, apartments that were built in the last decade or decade before that, but it's it's pretty minimal. So there is always this problem with um, housing availability in Santa Monica and new stock. And so I think you know if you look at basic economics, if you create more and more housing then you're going to sort of attract people into those newer houses that uh, apartments that can afford them. And they're usually going to move out of the, the, the older stock. So I, I moved to, uh, to Santa Monica from New York more than you know, about eight years ago. And we rented in an old converted condo um, because there wasn't really a lot of new available stock to us. So people like that will, will live in these new houses or create more housing. Um, so I think it's a positive thing. I think that it, it's going to, make the city more dynamic and I think it's going to alleviate some of the challenges. I can also see why some people will think it's not that positive because most of the new stock that will be brought will be market rate housing, which is very expensive. Um, and a percentage of that will be affordable housing because you have to do it. But, you know, I think the, the, the middle income area is, is really the hardest part of housing to produce. And so I think I can see that as being more of a downside because you know the the teachers, the the firemen, the police, um, that level of income housing isn't being produced. So that's sort of the positive and the challenge, as I right. see it. Yeah, I, look from my perspective, I I think it's a positive. I think it's scary. I I, I think it's going to scare a lot of people. It's going to create anxiety. But the reason I think it's really important and why it's it's it is a positive is for far too long decision makers have been able to sort of ignore the ignore, ignore the issue. And just play the community card or play you know the, the the politics part of the policy card and i think the state has really said no community you can't do that anymore you have to be realistic about what housing you need and what you have to develop and we're going to force you to take a look at it examine it and really plan for it and so you got to look at do i have enough affordable do i have enough middle income do i have enough um, luxury to accommodate the population and do i have the infrastructure to to, to accommodate it and if I don't have all of those things, I have to produce a plan that does. And what that means is change is coming, which makes it scary or anxiety inducing for, for the populace. But at the end of the day, they're going to have a community that's more livable if they follow the plan, if they allow these plans to develop and move forward with them. Right on. I, I think I would add to that quickly, Martin, that um, I really am excited about this. And being in Santa Monica and living there as an architect, I think doing more mixed use type um, residential makes a lot of sense, especially in areas that maybe weren't um, available for residential in the past, but currently at, uh, I think it's Lincoln and Broadway, they just tore down our grocery store and they're building a new uh, mid-rise tower. Uh, a couple of my friends are designing that one. It's beautiful, but then the grocery store is going back in. Um, as a resident, 
traffic. That's the only thing I'll keep coming back to is when I have to go to the high school to pick up my daughter and it's a mile away and it takes me 15 minutes. That that can be a challenge, I think, really approaching how the, the traffic's going to work, maybe even trolleys, something else different that can start getting people around. So, you know, um, the first thing I was thinking about is when you run a company, you want to grow because, you know, you want to grow your you know your projects and you want to you know give space to your people to grow i was wondering what 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 do you guys think that pushes cities to want to grow what to begin with right because is is growth inevitable or is growth like inevitable and is there a benefit in the city you know because when you start thinking about this is do you want the city to grow and if if is is there a benefit in growing that, that that's not a well I, I think the reality of that is cities are Historically, and there's been a little shift in it right now, but cities are growing, right? The population has grown in this area. So the question becomes not, can you as a decision maker regulate that growth? Can you stop it? You're not stopping. People are moving in. So the question is, are you allowing greater congestion by not accommodating that growth? Or are you, are you going to have a plan to accommodate that growth and create the infrastructure to alleviate the, 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 uh, the congestion? To date, Places like Santa Monica think that by not building, they can stop the growth. What Brian's experience is, it's been the opposite. All it's done is add to the congestion. Um, and so the, the, that's why I think this is a great process, because at the end of the day, there's a recognition that, you know what, we have to count the number of people we have, and we got to figure out how to manage them. Yeah. Yeah, I think just to add to that, you know, I think cities generally want to grow without having to do anything, right? Because they want to be able to just keep growing their pie, right? Because that's they, that's great. It creates more revenue for them, but but doing as little as possible to do that, you know, so I think on the cities historically have been very uh, much mindful of knowing that their residents generally don't like the disruptions that come with development and the fear that comes with a tall building being built next to my house and you know, those types of things. Um, but, you know, we, LA is a very horizontal city. It's sort of very sprawling and not very tall, you know, and, and I think that we have a big population density here and there's no, there's no more land. So you, you've got to go up and it's not like New York where, where people are building high rises, you know, everywhere. So I, I think that, I think it's a really positive thing because I think that um, it, it's going to mean more housing development. And I think that's going to bring you know more revenue to the city. I think it's going to bring more. Uh, it's going to allow the city to grow. And I think cities want to grow. I think you know our, our society is a growth society. You know and that we want to keep growing, getting better, and improving. But then what comes with that is the need to think about general planning and like Brian mentioned, your know, infrastructure, public transportation, other ways of doing things. Sadly, even with all the changes in legislation and land use in Santa Monica and other places around parking requirements, so not requiring developers to provide as much parking. The reality is our residents all still drive cars and all need parking spaces. So until that sort of cultural phenomenon changes in LA, you know, we're gonna live in a congested city. Um, and, um, hopefully people will be able to live where they work and not have to drive their cars. You know, the first project that we built in Santa Monica on 7th and Arizona when we polled our residents more than 30% of them uh, either walked or biked to work. So that was really positive. That was 30% of people that weren't getting in their car in the morning and creating more traffic. So yeah, I think it'll be positive. Yeah, I mean, before we get into the connection between every dollar spent in a living unit and every dollar that you have to spend in everything you don't see for that living unit, <laughs> It's like, you know, infrastructure, sewers, roads, parkings, and then, you know, you start thinking schools, groceries, hospitals. I mean, it, it just doesn't stop. Uh, and I, I, I'm going to I'm going to quote uh, Jerry on this thing that you you can't uh, avoid growth, but you have to plan for growth. It's like you, you, it, there's there's no choice to do. There's just the one way. But uh, Adrian, maybe for you that I know you've been around in different cities in, in the world. Do you, can you just say one city that you think has deal, dealt with this problem uh, in a good way for you, like in, in, in any, any place in the world? I, I mean, I think nowhere is perfect, you know, and everything has different um, drivers. Like, you know, I lived in Manhattan for a long time and, 
you know, Manhattan's a vertical city, you know, they, they, everything goes up and they have an excellent underground, you know, um, subway system, which I think is the best way to get around New York. Like the silliest thing you can do is jump into a cab in the morning and try to go from Soho to Midtown. Uh, it'll take you, you know, 45 minutes. You jump on a train there in 15. So, but, you know, I think it's, it's hard to compare that to LA because, you know, LA is like Sydney where I'm from. It's a big, broad city where you've got to drive around everywhere and public transportation existed in the last century was taken away with the advent of cars. Um, you know, I lived in Singapore for a long time. I think they've got a really, they've done a really good job of having, um, you know, working commercial nodes of high rises and then they have a train system and a bus system and they sort of regulate the road differently. Like you can't drive on certain roads at certain times of day unless you're a taxi or a bus. So like that basically forces people to use public transportation. But I mean, I don't think anywhere is perfect. I think that's, um, you know, L LA from my reading of history and understanding, and I'm, Jerry can comment on this because land use has changed so much over the years, but I think this is the result of just the land use planning that happened over the last 40 or 50 years or the lack of. Mm, um, okay. <laughs> and, you know, and I think that's just had a big impact. I think that people that own single family homes are very um, strong group and they don't want to see density in their back in, in their neighborhoods. And that's the majority of the land use in LA is, is R1 and R2 zones. So mm. you can only build apartment buildings on commercial zones where there's no existing apartment building there today because of, you can't take apartment buildings down because of rent control. Uh, so, you know, it, it forces, LA has forced itself into building on the busiest road thoroughfares. So I can't say there's one city that's perfect. Right. Yeah, okay. well, that was long winded. I apologize. Right on. Um, and maybe Brian, to you as a citizen of the, of this particular city, and again, I'm trying to talk about a city, but I think this applies to any city that goes through the same thing, with one exception made. Um, is this push driven by a powerful, like positive economic growth, like you know, we 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 know that the the Silicon Valley turned into the Silicon Beach, and a lot a number of companies came down south, and they're trying to get this better condition here. But then I also hear a lot about the homeless situation, and how is this is this push trying to solve both problems, or is this push trying to get uh, the city right on the economic growth path? And as a citizen of the city, will this somehow improve the living conditions? Is that the, is that a question that makes sense for you? Yeah, this is um, definitely a big concern in Santa Monica. The homeless population, thefts, um, battery. There's a lot of things in Santa Monica, I wanna say covers it up. You don't hear about a lot of this on the news, um, but it exists. Um, I see it happening around the area, but. To me, it's gotta be a mix of the density. I think we were talking about with Adrian. The density is important. I think a walkable city is one of the most important things and actually invigorating things that, that I love to create um, where you don't need to get in your car. The scooters now are really prevalent along the beach, but um, Silicon Beach, you know, down in Playa, that whole area is, is in Santa Monica as well. Um, but, it, it's something that does have to be dealt with in terms of the, the homeless, so low income housing, but the challenge, even in Santa Monica, there are some areas that maybe aren't as affluent as others, but nobody wants the uh, low income housing, the homeless housing. Um, so they end up getting under, put underneath the uh, overpasses on the highways and they come through, clean them out. Um, the amazing thing to me in Santa Monica is literally the border between Venice, which is LA, and Santa Monica, they were along the boardwalk, but the tents go out into the sand um, to the beach at the border. Literally, there's a line in the sand and they know not to go past it. Otherwise, Santa Monica will take out their tent and, and throw it away. So, um, I don't know what the solutions are right now. I've seen several recent uh, attempts at doing some low income housing, and I think it's um, a challenge. The mayor of L.A. is taking that on. I think Santa Monica is trying to as well. Um, but I think the density, not having to get into a car, using a bike more. I have friends that won't drive their car in Santa Monica. They literally just want to get on their bike. And it's about a mile radius, any direction, up to Montana, 
to the promenade and then south to Main Street. That whole area is really a nice radius where you can walk. So I think walkability is important. But then the safety point that you brought up, Martin, with homeless and other issues um, comes into play. Hmm. Martin, I think you, you 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 know you touched on a few different areas and asking the question of Adrian about what is a great city. It, it's a it's an interesting moment in time. You have sort of and Santa Monica is somewhat of a microcosm of it. You have a declining you know retail or you have retail that's being impacted by homelessness. If you look, Whole Foods just closed their flagship store this week in San Francisco because of safety and homelessness issues. And that store had only been open for a year, I think it was. And that those issues are happening in Santa Monica. So you have the impact of those economic drivers that are traditional. You also have a community that was built as a single family kind of haven for the longest time that's now facing a change in that lifestyle. And you have office workers who are not wanting to return necessarily back to the office. So you're trying to figure out what to do with office. And it's not a homogeneous society like you may find in a in Singapore or in Hong Kong or some of those cities that work well in in, in that regard. And as Adrian pointed out, you have this policy. So just take LA. LA was zoned in 1978, I think it is, for 10 million to accommodate 10 million people in the city of Los Angeles. Through a series of down zonings and the like, we now accommodate 4.4 million people in the amount of capacity in our zoning. Hmm. We have 4.2 million people. That means everyone's fighting over, you know, I, I got, they'll say, I came here, I had a limited zoning. I knew that thing was going to get built here. And now you want me to up zone. So we, we have diminished our capacity. Santa Monica did the same thing. Santa Monica down zoned considerably, um, not leaving enough room. And so it's created this mass conflict um, and I think the things like the housing element and what the state is doing is forcing these communities like Santa Monica to take a look at themselves and say, you know, Brian, we do need to build along Lincoln and we need to densify Lincoln. We need to create transportation corridors. We need to get people into, you know, onto scooters or off, uh, uh, off out of their cars. And we need you to plan where that goes. And so I think that's why this is a positive. But what you're seeing is that you're, you're seeing the making of the sausage right now. It is messy, it is difficult, it is uh, yeah. arduous and people are fighting over it and angry over it. And you know, it's either gonna come out, people are either gonna walk away and leave the kitchen a mess yeah. or they're gonna actually cook something that's gonna be delicious and we're gonna clean up the kitchen and, and have a great evening, right? So yeah. I don't know what it's gonna be right now. I um, I do have a couple more things I wanna touch on, but I, I, I saw this, um, um uh, stand up guy saying that we should stop asking people for things like he, he, one of you said that you know for for a number of years the cities were hiding behind like you know a public hearing or the neighborhoods whatever and the guy was joking saying you know if the bleach bottle has to say don't drink we should not ask people <laughs> you know he said like re remove the do not drink from the bleach you know bottle and then 10 years later, ask people like, you know, the, the joke was like people generally don't have the whole picture or the view. And I think the leadership should somehow like set the bearing and, you know, digest the political cost and just get things done. And in my experience, sometimes after that happens, uh, everyone's happy. And then, you know, the, the, then you realize, yeah, it was good to do that, you know, whatever. So, Martin, so my, you suggested not being politically correct. The, to some degree, yeah. I will tell you, we don't have leaders anymore. We we no longer have people that can rip that off and 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 make that call. Uh, what we have are bureaucrats. We have people who are managing our systems, not no. leading us through the problems to get to a better place. I think we are starting to in, in Santa Monica. We just elected a couple new council members who I do think have the capacity to truly lead. Um, they they see that vision, and I think that that's a, that's that's a real opportunity. I'm hopeful for the new mayor in Los Angeles that that she wants to take the reins and actually lead, and not not just manage yeah. manage the problems. Um, but we haven't seen that for a long time, and and I don't know that we empower them or allow them. We you know we we are in a society that loves to tear our people down rather than build them up and support them in change. Yeah. Yeah, but no, I think your, your comment on the stand up guy, I think is a good one, because I think no matter what you propose as a developer, every 
a lot of people are going to hate it. Mm -hmm. They're going to come out. So it's almost like you come to the table, you say, we're going to do this. And they go, we, yeah, we hate that. And you go, okay, we're going to come and do this. And they go, we'd hate that as well. So it's like, yeah. okay, so take Lincoln Boulevard, for example, you know, a very congested, not a very attractive stretch of road from Venice to the 10. And, you know, it's all sort of auto dealerships, repair shops, strip malls. Like it's not a very attractive part of LA, but, you know, the, the vehemence that some people have about changing that to bring housing is a little, a little surprising to me. And I think it's just what it comes down to is a lot of people just are scared of change, like you said. And in 10 years time, these buildings will get built and people will just sort of absorb around and, and they'll adapt around it. And it won't have as crazy of an impact as they thought it did. And then and no, they won't care. So it's, it's actually just, like you said, I think give the direction and go and do it. And, and then let's see what happens in 10 years. Yeah. And I add to that, that then you say, okay, you didn't like one, you didn't like two, I'm doing nothing. Well, we also hate that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right? So what do we, what do, we do? Um, I do want to get a little bit into uh, the process and how the city will actually manage this because I've also read the word fiasco shows up a number of times where everything looks like promising, but then it doesn't happen. But before I, I go there, I wanted to ask another question. And this is, again, spinning in the back of my head when I read this. Uh, if you talk about like, uh, you know, low, mid income or moderate income, and you have a percentage of your buildings that have to accommodate that economy, at the end of the day, um, it, it's a tax game, not really a construction cost game. So it's like buying a car that it's that is going to cost you less money because you get some tax credit, but then you crash and, and you're repairing the car is too expensive for you. And to maintain the car is too expensive. And then maybe, you know, things that come with that are expensive. And so my question is, if the if this housing elements push pushes uh, hard to get low and moderate income, you know, accommodated in these thousands of units. How will that affect the, the, the general cost of living for the people that, to begin with, didn't have the enough income to pay for the market, you know, uh, value of the property? If they go to the same supermarket where a guy, you know, in Santa Monica doing that money is paying for stuff, what do you guys think about that combination? Is it, is, is it going to create any positive, uh, you know, blend there or is it going to create more chaos i i think adrian hit it on the head and i think he should really address this but you're not address in, in the in what you just described you're not addressing the missing middle how are you accommodating the the people who don't qualify for the low income and they can't afford the higher income because what happens is by accommodating the lower income you're outpricing the rest of it and so you're not building enough stock to make that happen I think what has to happen is you really have to provide incentives along the entire spectrum of the entire the entire housing spectrum. And I think then Adrian can come in and say, yeah, I can build to that. But yeah, I mean let's let's delineate like how these two types of projects are built. So, you know, on the one hand, if you're building hundred percent affordable housing using what they call LITEC or low-income housing tax credits, okay, firstly. The process to get those credits is so complicated. It is so long. There's not enough money in those uh, credit uh, buckets mm -hmm. that you have to go and get supplemental dollars from state, city, jurisdiction that also don't have money because everyone's competing for this very small pool of tax credits. Because the reason why developers do it that way is because low-income housing or even middle-income housing the, the, the revenue that's generated from the units is not enough to build the building. Mm -hmm. Okay, So the only reason why we, for example, are actively buying land in Santa Monica and building in Santa Monica is because the rents in Santa Monica are high enough to justify the cost of construction in the market today. I can't build, if, if, my, if the land was free to me in Van Nuys, I can't build a building because the rents I can generate, I'm talking about a market rate building, the rents I can generate in Van Nuys are not high enough to get me a, 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 a high enough yield to get financing from a lender and from equity to build the building. So I can't build anything in Van Nuys. So I have to focus on where I can build to get a you know to get financing. So what, what this ends up happening is the, the, the low-income housing gets credits, but the middle-income housing doesn't get any credits, which is what Jerry is referring to. There should be some 
benefits from state and city and federal so you can build middle income housing, which doesn't exist. So the low income housing takes forever to build. It's just as expensive, if not more than market rate housing. And it takes longer. And so it's, it, you know, it's brain damage and that's why nothing gets built. Whereas mm. on the market rate side, we are, we are it, it's enforced that we have to build a certain percentage as deed restricted low income units. And developers typically will pick the lowest level of income because none of those levels really benefit the net operating income of the building, but they cost the same to build as a market rate unit. They cost the same to operate as a market rate unit. So you're effectively building 15%, 10%, 20% of your building that's going to generate zero dollars of income and cost you more. So it only works if the rest of the market rate units generate enough income so you can build the building. So yeah. what ends up happening is you don't actually get that much housing built because it's so expensive. And then you only end up getting a very small percentage of affordable housing. Yeah. So really the solution would be to create dedicated funds for low income and middle income housing that developers can draw down on to, to build these things. Um, and that would be probably tax credits or, or bonds or whatever it is. But that's really the, the, the challenge in building you know, in, in, LA, in California right now and in LA. I would also submit that you that we're too hyper focused on putting affordability on the back of housing alone. Affordability comes in many forms. Affordability is how much do you pay for groceries? It's how much is my childcare? It's how much is my transportation? It's right. how much are my utilities? It's it's all of those things. And we try to say that the only way to make a community affordable is to force it into the housing piece, which accounts for hopefully 30% of someone's or less than 50% of someone's expenditures. Mm -hmm. We're ignoring the other 50%. And, and I think if you start looking at policies that broaden the horizon of what does it mean to be affordable and we supplement some of those other areas, it, it may make housing more affordable or more livable and, and, and allow you more income to do that. But we, we're not willing to do that yet. Yeah, I guess that's where the question was going. Is like you only make affordable the the buying of the property, and then what happens with everything else? If you go out of the street and you're living in a city that is as expensive as uh, Santa Monica, just you know, right. big one. Um, and in your experience, uh, and and I think you've already touched on this. I've heard this uh, pain in the neck of of getting things actually through, and now the housing element poses a different story where. The cities that were supposed to be the bad, the bad dog that was, you know, keeping the property, um, now they're kind of like, you know, strangled by the state, saying you no longer can bark at these guys. You have to let them walk past the yard. Um, in your experience, is that real? Is that does that really happen when when you have to actually execute on this, or is there any way that the cities can find around this to kind of like continue to? you know, delay, avoid, or divert these uh, developments? So it's real. I mean, and, and it, it's community by community. The, some communities have not lived up to their required uh, housing plan, and therefore they're subject to more stringent controls by the state. And in those communities, it's absolutely real. Uh, there's also uh, real teeth now to the Builder's Remedy Program, where um you know the city can't really say no to you if if you're within the zoning are there ways that cities can trip you up can stall you of course there's always ways that they can take their time doing building permits they can try to find uh environmental impacts but the law does try to make sure that they that they play fair in that sandbox um and so yeah there's there's real teeth to it today in a way that there hasn't been in the past um, cities like Santa Monica or Los Angeles aren't quite in that completely being forced into the the corner and 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 being that quiet dog. Uh, but you know, as they start looking at their numbers, we'll see if they end up there. You know, if they don't build housing quickly, they are going to end up there. And I, I don't, Brian, are you seeing as you move through the the planning process that cities are changing in their attitude? Uh, a little bit. It's still one of the hardest, I think, cities, LA in general, to get things done. 
we're doing a project up in Boise, Idaho right now, 700 units on a golf course, um, active adult, um, more workforce housing and some townhomes, but the neighbors obviously are always a challenge, but um, yeah, it's still hard to get things through. Um, I do think if we look at this in a way to find incentives for the city, actually, obviously tax revenues are going to increase. Um, there may be some ways. I think we're still in a transition period with the pandemic where a lot of office buildings were brought up earlier are empty. So there's ways to actually backfill into this. Santa Monica right now is somewhat hurting with their retail. It's known as a uh, tourist city. I think the tourists didn't show up for a couple years. Uh, the shopping mall off the Third Street Promenades uh, I want to say maybe not half vacant, but it's just a lot of stores disappeared. It's it's kind of re reinventing itself a bit. So I think there's an opportunity within that for Santa Monica. I'm looking forward to it just because it's it's changed as I've been here. I think I first came out in '96 or '97, helping with some of the reconstruction of um, the buildings from the Northridge earthquake. Um, and at that time, some of those, uh, the lows, the hotels along um, Muscle Beach there by the pier were boarded up. So it really has changed over time. And I think we're looking at maybe another reinventing of itself with the train now coming to the city. I think all those things are, are positive. I think Martin, from a practical perspective, you know, we, we see that if you are conforming to the zoning and the development standards within the city, then it's just a process really. Yeah, and it right. just really comes down to city staff capacity, which has gone down because of COVID. So it's slow, but you know, if you follow the right. process, they're going to approve you. Uh, you know, if you try to do something outside the process, they're going to fight you, you know, and mm -hmm. neighbors will try to fight you. But if you stay, you know, in the box, you, you should be fine. You're fine. Yeah. I mean, I would say that even in the areas, cities can no longer easily down, you know, reduce the size of your project just because the community wants. That is that is more difficult across every city. So if the zoning allows you to get X number of units, then you even though they have a process that they can make difficult for you or take you through, at the end of the day, the state has somewhat tied their hands on their ability to say, no, I don't want, I want you to build half of what the zoning allows, which historically has been the case. Yeah. And does that help you guys with like, because we were just talking about the same thing, the, the, the evil in the room, it's always the funding of the project. And if you have so many uncertainties and you are the lender, of course, you want to know that, you know, the everything from like rent control to the ability to get the approvals to how long it's going to take to do, you know, something. Does this help in any way to know that there is a process that will flow and there's no, I mean, it may take a little longer, but it's not going to have any surprises for us a hundred percent i mean the, the biggest risk is the entitlement risk because typically in los angeles you have to buy land and then take it through that process so land's very expensive and the entitlement process is very expensive too so there's a lot of at-risk dollars so to for the cities to sort of streamline processes and make it less risky it's going to entice more developers to take the, the risk right. you know um there's a like not to sort of uh, speak outside of Santa Monica too much, but in Hollywood, for example, like there's a known litigation risk as a developer. If you try to go for a project in Hollywood, there are some groups out there that like to litigate developers. And so in our mind, when we're thinking about where we want to try to do development in LA, Hollywood's kind of like always like, oh, we're not Hello. quite sure if we're going to get stuck in three years of lawsuit there. Let's try to focus maybe somewhere else, you know? So Santa Monica has has done a better job of that over the years. Hmm. Interesting. Um, I guess my my other question, and I I, I will just ask for opinions here. I, I don't think we have maybe the right information, but I was, you know, uh, Jerry, you went to Colombia, right? Uh, short ago, yeah. Um, you know, I've been around Latin America a while. Uh, I mean, a lot, and I've seen a number of places where building houses is wild west and you just build 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 and then you realize well where is the sewer going and and, and forget about a train or a, or a subway it's the basics do we have enough electricity of course there's not do we have enough water there's not do we have enough sewers there's not is this in your minds is this housing element push 
part of a bigger plan that considers everything that will come with this or is it just like we need to uh, we need to give people housing and then we'll see <laughs> kind of thing no i mean i think that's i mean one of the benefits of the california development process is it forces you to look at all of those issues i mean right. and it forces you to address the questions of do we have sufficient infrastructure that's the good part of it the bad part of it is you can argue over it and fight about it and litigate over it, which can extend the time of the project or whether or not Adrian invests in Hollywood, right? So, you know, that's that's the good and bad of it. The, this plan and housing elements in general and specific plans for cities to think through all of those issues, which I think is the positive part. Uh, so you, you're not going to see the the favela of, uh, of that you, see in, you know, in Rio or in, in Medellin, you know, it's mm -hmm. it, it, you do have the requirements for infrastructure and that that is studied and done right it doesn't mean that it's a it's a it's a perfect process and it doesn't mean that brian doesn't feel like we need more transportation in in uh santa monica <laughs> but it does say that our traffic you know i'll do a traffic study and tell you whether my traffic flows or not right on and brian from your maybe more like architectural urban planning uh, views what what would you think this comes with the whole package or this is more like let's push the solution for this problem here and then because that's uh the concern is also when you do everything you know like um you cannot build a building first and then figure the uh, sewer uh, no that definitely understood um well with CEQA and the EIRs I mean there's a lot of up, upfront stuff that happens with these I think even around Inglewood that's all changing very quickly as well um I definitely, as a, a master planner, as well as an architect, I think Santa Monica needs to get out in front of it. Um, I do always have this opinion, um, if you build it, they work, will come. Housing is a big aspect of having people, uh, the retail, the, the mixed use piece kind of comes afterwards after the people are there. But in more of these densified areas, downtown LA had started moving in this direction. It started getting the population there that it needed um, around LA Live that we did years ago and even the new project across the street um, from crypto.com. Those things started, but then backed off. I think Santa Monica right now has an opportunity to get out ahead of this. Um, as I said, kind of reinventing some things. I'm not sure if the staff is ready for that or they're doing it actively. I'm seeing it more in LA than I am in Santa Monica. Um, mm. But yeah, I think all of that has to be planned for. Um, Currently, I just visited um, Arizona, and I lived back in Arizona back in the 90s. Um, Tempe is a university town, and we had driven through the main area. I was there with my daughter, and oh my goodness, it's like a mini Manhattan. Everything's around that mid-level 13, 14-story range, but there's street trolleys, there's active street life, and that kind of thing I think is more exciting. If the city can plan for it, put it in the right corridors, versus just have it happen haphazardly. Obviously infrastructure, sewers, water is all very important, but they're pretty conservative with some of that stuff, making sure it's available. Um, right. Marina Del Rey is another example where they're building a lot there. And even, you know, the traffic just doesn't work in Marina Del Rey in terms of the fingers going out to the inlets, but somehow the traffic, I don't see it. Maybe people are using bikes or public transportation there, but um, yeah, it's evolving. Hmm. Perfect. Um, one, maybe we're getting into the last uh, few minutes. Um, and there's something else that I was kind of like spinning my head around and maybe uh, you guys can uh, give us some of your views. You own a property there since 1996 and you know, it's your property. You're not even renting it and you're living there. And of course, you know the value of your property and maybe you have a, a loan or a mortgage or you don't. Uh, or you have developed a building there. And Adrian, I just read before the, uh, uh, like yesterday that 4,000 units were approved in the last 20 years in Santa Monica and roughly 4,000 units were approved in eight months with this push. So that is how unbalanced life seems or the fear of change. It's, it's dramatic when you see it that way. How do you guys think this will affect the value of property and the, <laughs> You know, is is it going to 
raise the bar or is it going too low? Because it says, you know, a supply and demand kind of thing versus now there's more people willing to come to the city. So there's more people willing to pay for a nicer building that was finally built. So my building now all of a sudden is worth more money. Yeah. How do you think that's going to apply? Let me touch on it real quick, just because your taxes go up. Uh, I owned a place and then mm -hmm. taxes went up and then the property values went down. They went down a little bit, but they always go up. Um, but ownership, I think, is important. I think we're talking a lot about apartments and that's transient a little bit more. So I think there's a something to be looked at there. A few years back, condos were all the rage. Now it's apartments. So I think that's something we should probably add into this thought, too. And you guys may have some other thoughts, Adrian or Jerry. Yeah, I, look, I think um, I think it depends on what moment in time you're looking at. So, and what else is affecting value? So, you know, the value of property today across the whole country is lower than it was two years ago. You know, mm -hmm. so um, you know, you're sort of always at the whim of what's happening macroeconomically. I, I think that. Santa Monica is still seen as a jewel in the country by anybody outside of LA. You say the word Santa Monica and people have a reaction. That's usually very positive. And the phenomenon I experienced when I moved here from New York was, and I lived in Santa Monica, was I remember counting at least 18 or 19 different state license, number, license plates from Hawaii to Idaho to North Dakota. It's like everybody moves to LA and they come to Santa Monica first. That's the draw of Santa Monica. So I do think there'll be really, I think it's going to improve value. Uh, I think sadly, you know, the timing of this housing element approval where we are economically in the country is really tough because mm. now it's made it even harder for developers to get financing to build stuff. But actually what tax on top of that is the most recent passing of these transfer taxes. Like that's, that's had a, a very meaningful impact on, on, on property value. So, you know, we have to buy land and that seller, we buy the land for whatever, $10 million and they've got to pay their transfer tax on that. But then we build a building that's worth uh, $200 million and we've got to pay, you know, a huge transfer tax on that. And so that just actually then impacts what we can buy land for today because we have to account for that in the future. Mm. And so that's stopping us from doing transactions. And in fact, it's going to stop people from building anything. So they gave us this great housing element update and then this transfer tax came and that's really going to slow things down. Um, but I do think overall values in Santa Monica, if you look at the course of 50, 100 years, it's consistently going up mm -hmm. because there's not a lot of supply here and it's a tough city to do anything. So I think that will continue. Yeah, I to put a finer point on it, look, we... the this passage of these transfer taxes alone created a 10% discount effectively in the value. It, it immediately hit value by a 10 to, between 10 and 12%, depending on the community. That said, over time, you, you do go up. And the reason you go up is what you said. You built 4,000 units over the last 20 years. You approved 4,000 today. You should have been building 4,000 every year for those 20 years. So you're already 40, you know, 80,000 units in Santa Monica behind of where you should be. Right. Building 4,000 in a month doesn't change that dynamic. You are still not in a supply, in a, in a point where supply outstrips demand to where you start seeing uh, pricing, uh, you know, re-regulating itself. So right. you're until, I don't think there's a way you can build yourself out of this housing crisis, and I don't think there's a way you can now build yourself into a downward, uh, a declining value. It just there's we're too far in a deficit to see that happen. Yeah. Well, I was also thinking that it's it's not like purely uh, supply and demand. It's more like uh, like if you lived here for X amount of years, and now there is a stadium next door that they're building, um, is the value of your property affected by? the growth of the city and usually when people like that suburban quiet area and you all of a sudden turn the neighborhood into a more active uh, neighborhood is that going to affect the perception of value because at the end of the day is how much are people willing to pay for something if everybody wants to go away because my not my nice little house now has a you know five unit uh, five story building that it's kind of like watching my backyard from high up there um, I don't know. That was kind of like a, a multiple level combination, right? 
Yeah, I, I have not yet good. seen that yeah. phenomenon in California or in this no. arena. I, I think the popul the density of of the population alone means that there's going to be someone willing to pay up for that house to be next to that stadium. You know, it's yeah. it's it's just I, the reality of having the number of people that we do. We're not in suburban Iowa. It's mm -hmm. yeah. I, I think to, to further Jerry's points, I think that that what he's really saying is is that there's a fundamental un massive undersupply of housing across all of LA and there's no more, and, and there's no more land really to, to build. And so, you know, there's a lot of competition to, to buy houses and, you know, you, you might be, you might be happy to buy that house next to the five story building because it's, you know, you, it's in your budget more than the house three doors down and you have to live with a building next to you, but you live in an urbanized dense environment and like, you just accept that, you know? Yeah. Um, so I think it doesn't, I don't think that has an impact. I think you know, cities, I, I think LA is just, is a, is a magnet for people, uh, which is great. And I think that there's not enough land to build enough housing. So there's always an undersupply. Yeah. I think at a smaller scale or lower density, maybe ADUs are another thing that's come up recently. Uh, a lot of these smaller houses are able to add a couple more units in the back. That's one other uh, aspect of doing it. And then even the stock of office buildings that are half full right now, maybe the top floors go to um, residential as well. So that I think that that type of uh, thinking all around for housing, what what type of housing you know can we introduce into the area would be important. You know, I, um, I think everyone should be happy about this fact that this will not lower property value. Uh, I always find it hilarious that people absolutely hate change we were talking about is you know density that but then they go to a higher density place you go oh this is so nice you walk there are cafes on the sidewalk and you can do this and there's that and they absolutely love it but then you go back and you go well uh, i don't think you can uh, eat your cake and have it too in a way um but i overall it seems to me that um there's no probably no question about the positive impact of this it will you know deliver value to the city I really like the idea that it's forcing cities to review their planning. I, I read that a lot. I was curious if that was a real thing that they really did, or it was more like a, a you know a, a check there. But at the end of the day, the fact that it poses that pressure on on reviewing your planning and assessing your needs, much like it should at a point, give cities the idea: okay, if you're going to have so many more people, how many more? firemen you're going to need, how many more policemen, how many more teachers, how many more doctors, how many more lawyers. And, and that took me to a question that I added, added to my list, which is in, in, in this few last minutes, um, when you see down the road, like this is for the next 10 years. So they're, they're not going to build this overnight. Of course, you can approve them overnight, but <laughs> we all know that building them, it's another story. In the idea that the cities that are pushing these housing elements want to develop this growth and, and materialize it in actual buildings where people can go and move in. What do you see as the, uh, the weakest link in the chain? What, what, can, what can slow them? You know? The weakest link of the chain is not addressing homelessness and public safety. If you look mm -hmm. at communities that whose policies are super permissive around those issues, uh, Portland, San Francisco, LA, you see it costing development or you see it put on pressure where if Adrian wants to take a lender to see and, and that lender is going to step over, you know, homeless people or get accosted or whatever, that investor is not investing and Adrian's not building is the reality. And so the, the, you see what, you know, Brian described what happened in downtown LA, the reason downtown LA is you know, is, is as bad off as it is, is not just that we're not having people return to the office. It's that the, the homeless crisis has forced people to leave even the residential community because they don't feel safe. So, you know, these communities, I, I think that's why if you look at Santa Monica, they adopted their set of five priorities for the next two years. And their number one adopted priority is addressing homelessness. And, and I think that that's what you have to do to allow these plans to actually be implemented in a way that makes sense because i had i had i had my options like tax uh the fed rates labor shortage you know for construction i did not see that coming yeah i mean i think on your list there like the the, the uh, unknown future unknown future taxation impacts i think 
you know, where like what happened with the transfer tax ha has a drastic impact on our ability to, 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 to build these projects because just to give you an example, it's not the only factor, obviously the economic changes that are happening too, but my ability to buy land in Santa Monica, the value has gone down by half. And a, a big part of that is from the transfer tax. A big part of it is also the increase in interest rates and things like that. But the transfer tax has a big, big bite out of the land value. So, you know, will something else get passed in two years where there's another tax tacked on and this and that and the other? Like that, that could be another way in which, you know, there's going to be headwinds to actually- Adrian, what, what happens if we're successful in November of next year and we reverse the transfer tax? Do you think that opens a floodgate? I think it's going to make it much better. I, I think that it, it it's uh, it's going to make it easy for us to um, buy, buy land because I think you've got a seller expectation here and, you know, we're saying, well, we can only pay this. And if we can bridge that gap because of the transfer tax, then yeah, maybe more deals will get done that will lead to more projects. It's really at the land level where there's a big disconnect um, and transfer tax has a huge part to play in that. So if it gets changed in November, then yeah, I think it's going to have a benefit. I think the timing, like I said initially, of the macroeconomic environment is really sucks from a timing standpoint because I think just generally capital markets are a bit frozen and we need those to build our projects. We don't build 100% with our own money, so. Yeah. All right, yeah. And do you see the, the, the interest rates going down? Eventually. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I hope so. All right. I'll just yeah. give you guys a very specific example, like the cost of money to borrow to, to buy land as a land loan is now in the low double digits. So it's pretty much doubled in a year. Wow. So if you buy a piece of land for $20 million and you borrow half of that, and it takes you two years to put a shovel in the ground, that's $2 million of extra money that the project has to bear just to carry the land. Well, so then like you, every your exit just, strategy. Yeah. yeah. Adrian, I mean, with, the, with, the, with where cap rates have gone, you, you don't have an exit anymore in what you've planned because where, where you may have been buying into a five or six, you're now buying into a seven and hoping, you know, you're, you're actually at an eight and you can't get back down to the seven to the five or six, you know? So, yeah, I mean, that's, that's hard. the economic challenge within the, you know, modeling that we do where capital. So the equity that invests in the deals is expecting a higher return because of the perceived market risk. So you hmm. have to then solve for better returns. And then yes, the exit cap rate has spread by 50 to 100 basis points. So you have to build to a higher going in yield. Like all of this just eats away at land value. And Santa Monica is lucky that the land value is really, really high. So there's still land value in Santa Monica at the end of the day. But other places that's kind of disappeared, you know. I will say, Martin, I mean, before we wrap up, yep. something I said earlier to you, the good news about Santa Monica is it feels like it's moving closer to being more amenable for development and that there's a, with this plan and with the, the folks that are being elected, it feels more like they're being thoughtful and, and, and not reactionary and they understand the need to develop growth. And I do think that's contrasting to the direction other cities in the area like LA are going. Hmm. Well, I know we're like two minutes uh, out and, um, I just want to thank you guys. I know there were there were one or two questions that we got, and we got a little uh, kind of like driven by the conversation. Uh, I just wanted to thank uh, the three of you, Adrian, Brian, and Jerry. I I really enjoy these kind of conversations. I hope everyone uh, in the audience did enjoy it too. I know there could be more things we can talk about, but I think we covered at least everything that I had kind of like planned for today. And I do hope you did enjoy it as much as I did. Uh, thank you again for being part of this. And, you know, we'll be posting more information about our next uh, webinars. We do have a, a couple more coming down the road. But for today, I think it's been great. And I really like the idea that we're getting this dynamic of sharing the views of, you know, people like yourselves that are so vested in the activity that you know this from you know your actual uh, you know personal business so thank you again so much and thank you everyone for joining
we want to make a commitment to starting sharp and ending sharp. So this will be the end of it. Appreciate Thank it. You, so Martin. Much. Thank you for having us. Thank you, Jerry and Adrian. Thank you. Thank you, Stella. Bye. All right. Take care.